What has happened, everybody? James Hancock here. I'm back with a spoiler-free review for Love Lies Bleeding, a movie that goes into limited release this weekend, but I'm going to hold off on discussing any real specifics or spoilers until A24 puts the movie out into a few more theaters. But what I can tell you is that this movie is a down-and-dirty, very solid, and very gnarly little thriller, the kind that we so rarely see. And basically, in the 90s, we had tons of great thr thrillers, but it's been an, an endangered species in recent years. But... This is one of those movies where it feels like a its source of inspiration was some like like beat up old like creased paperback covered in blood stains or maybe with like a few missing pages on the side from being torn out to like to roll joints or snort lines or whatever. But it just this is a a dirty movie in a lot of ways. But I say it in the, in like the most affectionate way humanly possible. But I don't want to oversell it. But I did really enjoy it. Like if you miss seeing sex, drugs, and rock and roll in your entertainment, you're going to dig this movie. And if sex, drugs, and rock and roll are not enough or are not your thing, this movie also gives us tons of basically generous quantities of blood and gore or vomit or rotten teeth or terrible diets, chain smoking, shitloads of guns, and a full-blown competition between the entire cast to see who can rock out the ugliest haircut in all of showbiz. And the good news is, hooray, they all win. Everybody's haircut in this movie is completely, totally atrocious, but they are precisely the haircuts that are required for this movie, which is basically an hour and 44 minutes of complete and total abject squalor, along with some violence and sex and dramatic confrontations and all that good stuff. Basically, long story short, I couldn't take my eyes off it. Thanks to stars Kristen Stewart, Katie O'Brien, and Ed Harris. Now, where do we want to start? Let's just start with Katie O'Brien, because I feel like Kristen Stewart, people have been, you know, enjoying her roles basically since Panic Room almost 20 years ago, or maybe more than 20 years ago at this point. And Ed Harris, I've been watching him and enjoying him in movies and shows since Creep Show back like in 1982. But Katie O'Brien, I'm more or less unfamiliar with, apart from a small role in Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. The less said about her role in that movie, the better. It's a shame this wasn't her first movie because she just comes blasting out of the gate. And I think this movie's going to earn Katie O'Brien legions of fans. But I guess before I go any further, I should just say in uh, broad strokes, what is the story and who made it? So I guess the, the official logline or the official premise from over on Wikipedia is, in the 1980s, reclusive gym manager Lou falls hard for Jackie, an ambitious bodybuilder headed through town to Las Vegas in pursuit of her dream. But their love ignites violence, pulling them deep into the web of Lou's crime family. And that's Pretty good. It more or less gets like the uh, the broad strokes, but it doesn't get any of the interesting kind of character beats and or like massive twists and turns that are featured throughout the movie. But I should also mention that this movie was directed by Rose Glass and co-written by Rose Glass and Veronica Tolfilska, if I'm saying her name correctly at all in any way, shape, or form. In any case, they make a great team because I love original movies. I love original stories. I love mean and nasty crime stories with sex and violence. It's amazing that such a cheap, inexpensive, and oftentimes potent form of storytelling has just been so completely, totally neglected by our homegrown entertainment industry in recent years. But I think the first question a lot of people are going to ask is, is it better than or worse than or equal to Bound by the Wachowskis from 1996? And I did a podcast recently called Naughty 90s Nostalgia Part 5 where we sang the praises of Bound left and right. There, there's some overlap, but this is a very different kind of story. First and foremost, it's out in the American Southwest. I mean, you're dealing with deserts and canyons and caverns and you know, almost kind of hallucinatory imagery at times. Whereas Bound felt very slick, very like hard-boiled noir, felt very like city-bound. And so stylistically and tonally, the two movies are very different. And also, Bound felt more or less like a um, kind of good old-fashioned tale of good versus evil. You got the uh, the two young lovers who are trying to basically steal money from the mob. So they're not that good, but they're at least nicer than the mob that they are stealing from. Love Lies Bleeding has many more kind of moral gray areas. But my biggest fear in advance going into the movie was that it would turn out to be an overly simplistic narrative where you have these two innocent angels being harassed and pursued by all these mean, scary men all around them. And much to my delight, and much to my surprise, Everybody in this movie is totally fucked up. I mean, some are a little bit nicer than everybody else, but um, yeah, there's a there are a lot of really unsavory characters in here. And I should have known better going into it because Rose Glass, her previous movie, Saint Maud, which was five years ago, it's amazing that it took her five years to get her next movie up and up and running. I'm sure COVID had something to do with that. But her first flick, Saint Maud. It might have been a little slow, but goddamn, it was mean and it was effective and it was disturbing. If if you like low budget kind of, I won't say supernatural, but low budget religious horror 
that's more or less grounded in reality. But with a little touch of the supernatural, St. Maude is well worth hunting down. And while Love Lies Bleeding is not a supernatural thriller in any way, shape, or form, there's some stylistic ingredients where you can tell the filmmaker wants to leave at least a little room for doubt. Like, am I literally seeing what I'm seeing? Or is this just like a visual metaphor to kind of communicate a certain emotion or a vibe and we just kind of kind of roll with it? And I think it'll be, it'll be interesting to see where people land on that. But when it comes to just the visual style, like the, the visual grammar that's being used to tell the story, you can tell that Rose Glass has leveled up in the last five years. Her DP on this is uh, Ben Fortisman. He has a great eye. The movie looks just absolutely stunning. And it helps if you're in the American Southwest where like you could basically close your eyes and point the camera and find a beautiful vista. But none of that would matter if you didn't have characters that you can get emotionally invested in. And Kristen Stewart and Katie O'Brien, holy shit, they really delivered this movie. They're instantly fascinating. I mean, when you say likable, think, oh, they're a nice person. They help old ladies cross the street and so on and so forth. Like they're not nice in that sense, but they are charismatic and they are electric and they are, you, you, you're like, like a moth being drawn to the flame. You want to watch them. You want to be around them. You want to see what they're up to because the world in which they operate is seedy. It's just dark. I guess I should, uh, I guess, reveal a little bit about who the characters are and what they do in this world. And this is all covered, this is all material that's covered in the trailer, so it's not a spoiler. But you got Ed Harris, who's kind of like a local businessman slash criminal, who seems like his, his two main sources of, of income are this gun range or the shooting range, as well as a gym. And he lets his daughter run the gym, even though the, uh, the daughter and the father are, are strange. They have not spoken in many years. They have a lot of uh, active contempt for one another. But both of their lives are turned upside down when this hitchhiker rolls through town. She's on her way out to Vegas, and she basically needs a place to stay, and she needs to earn a few bucks along the way. So she's working for Ed Harris out at the gun range, but she's sleeping with Kristen Stewart, who runs the gym where she works out. So there's a lot of, I guess, uh, tensions that are about to boil over, but making things even more complicated, Kristen Stewart's sister is married to a complete and total scumbag who also works for Ed Harris, and that couple is played by Jenna Malone and Dave Franco. Dave Franco and Jenna Malone are fine. I would say they they serve their role, they play their role adequately, but no one's gonna come no one's gonna come away from this movie saying those two stole the show. It's really this unholy trinity at the core where you get this mean, savage old man with long hair. And if I if I were to grow my hair out, I would look just like Ed Harris in this movie. So I felt a um I guess a sentimental affection for that hairstyle that he was rocking out. But within this family clan that includes Ed Harris and Kristen Stewart and Jenna Malone and Dave Franco. Like, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of history, a lot of water under the bridge. There are a lot of literal and figurative bodies buried all around, and so it's like all it needs is like a, a match to make the whole thing just kind of go up in a blaze. And so that match comes in the form of Katie O'Brien. And once again, I thought Katie O'Brien was going to basically be like a, like a superhero who is like devoid of all human flaws or so on and so forth. She's just as fucked up as everybody else and delightfully so, but when she's in a good mood, her personality is so warm and she's so charismatic and she's so physically and aesthetically pleasing to look at, you might find yourself overlooking some of the uh, the warning signs early on. And I'll say this, if you've ever enjoyed lifting weights in your life, whether you're just a casual enthusiast who likes to stay in shape or you're a full-blown gym rat where you're just, you know, swole as the goal and you got veins popping out of your head and your neck and so on and so forth, I think everybody's going to want to go to the gym after seeing this. Uh, Katie O'Brien, she's incredibly inspiring because she's just shredded enough where you totally buy her as a full-blown bodybuilder. However, she's still very aesthetically pleasing. And obviously, when it comes to fitness and being uh, desirable, everybody's got a kind of a different point of view. Some people don't like seeing muscles on women. I love, I love very athletic, fit women. But when they're able to be fit and muscular, but at the same time, incredibly... I guess graceful and lithe and agile and still very feminine. That is a uh, a combo that put, makes me uh, weak in the knees. And obviously, this is a movie about two women who fall in love. I don't know if they were that preoccupied with whether or not I was going to be all that turned on by uh, what goes down in this movie. But I was. You know, <laughs> there's, there's just no getting around it. I like muscular women, and she and uh, Kristen Stewart, they just fucking go for it. Like you really believe it. And this is not some sort of kind of like soft focus lens, kind of like lovey dovey, you know, soft core porn nonsense. This is mean and rugged and shot sometimes in unflattering light. And it can be a little bit, um, I don't know, it's almost like a little bit too intimate and too personal, like, like the cameras maybe going in like a, a little bit closer than we would like to go, but it is visceral and it's intense and it's believable. And so, yeah, I was totally on the hook, totally invested in this kind of whirlwind sexual romance going on between the two of them. And I think a big reason why so many of these ingredients stir together so well or so um, harmoniously is you have this 
killer score kind of pounding throughout the whole movie by Clint Manziel. And if his name sounds familiar, you will recognize some of his work from a lot of movies by Darren Aronofsky. He did the music for Requiem for a Dream. He did the music for The Wrestler. He did the music for Black Swan. I mean, this guy, he knows what the fuck he's doing. His music from Requiem for from a Dream was so iconic at that time, it started being reused in trailers over and over again, even with movies that have nothing to do with Requiem for a Dream. Like The Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers was using Clint Menzel music from Requiem for a Dream as a way of kind of really making that, tl- that that trailer stick to landing, and it fucking works. But he's also done a lot of scores for people like Ben Wheatley. He's an incredibly accomplished and incredibly powerful composer. So if you like synth scores, if you like very stylized scores, I think a lot of dramas in the modern age overlook how the the soundtrack or the score needs to be yet another character in the movie and it needs to help with the, the style and the tone and the atmosphere. And there's just nothing more boring than it's like a long kind of overly grounded, overly authentic drama where it feels like, you know what, this is starting to resemble reality. I can go outside and get all the reality I want for free. I want a movie. I want a heightened state of emotional experience. I want a, a whirlwind of emotions. And so yeah, getting a kick-ass composer and a kick-ass D- DP and you know, a great crew. A director is only as good as the crew that they choose to, to surround themselves with. And if your editor and your composer and your DP and all these key roles are not being performed by really solid craftspeople, then your movie's totally fucked. So yeah, seems like uh, Rose Glass understands fully the value of what these uh, different collaborators bring to the table. And speaking of collaborators and needing every aspect of your movie to work, the posters for this movie, that's what actually got my attention in the first place. I saw this poster with Katie O'Brien. I was like, I don't even care what the movie's about. As long as I get to see her flexing and going through her poses, then I'll be uh, entertained to some degree. And I think so often um, studios or even smaller studios, they'll overlook the value of a great poster or a great t- trailer. They'll say, oh, it's just marketing materials. Like, who cares? For me, for a movie to be great, every single aspect of the movie has to be great or as great as you can create under under the circumstances where you might find yourself or where, where you might be working. Like, even with the premiere, like, think about Madam Web a couple of weeks ago. Everybody was talking about the premiere to the point almost where like they'd rather just talk about the pictures from the premiere as opposed to the movie itself. And the same might be held true here with the Love Lies Bleeding because here we see Kristen Stewart going to, I think, the New York premiere. Clearly, they they interrupted her right in the middle of going to church and said, you got to get to the New York premiere of Love Lies Bleeding. And I just, of course, but that's a pretty outrageous outfit, but it definitely sets the tone for what you can expect from this movie. But I mentioned before how this movie managed to confound my expectations, but I can't emphasize it enough. This movie will be surprising from start to finish. Very rarely did I find myself ahead of the movie. I was like, oh shit, like where's it going now? Oh my God, where's it going now? Because every once in a while, because a lot of the characters are on drugs, you're not quite sure, am I seeing what they think they're seeing or am I seeing something that's actually happening? And it just makes the movie just that much more kind of dangerous and unpredictable and I think more movies need to have a feeling of danger about them like this is not one of those movies that's like you know feel bad entertainment where like everybody's poor everybody's mean everybody's upset all the time and like there's no music and there's no joy like there is comedy and sex and violence and just wild shit happening from start to finish like if I were to describe this movie in one word it might just be outrageous it's it's very successfully attempting to be outrageous which leads me to perhaps my my one criticism maybe this movie isn't quite as outrageous as 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 it would like to believe that it is i mean it'll be plenty outrageous there's a woman sitting behind me where quite literally she was gasping in like hysteria and horror but also sometimes amusement you could tell she was clutching her pearls but also laughing and having a good time she stayed and she enjoyed the movie from start to finish but some people will find this movie to be quite shocking but you can always tell when a movie's trying maybe a little bit too hard or they're kind of showing their hand like we are quite li- like deliberately trying to shock you right now as opposed to just letting the shock kind of organically just kind of like wash over you. And that judgment obviously is incredibly subjective. What one person might find to be deliberately provocative might seem totally normal to yet another person. But as I was watching it, I was like, yeah, Rose Glass, she's definitely trying to kind of poke the audience with a stick and see how they respond. But I wish more filmmakers would. We have so many filmmakers now where they just seem to be content to have their movies just be yet another form of content. I feel like content for me is media that's very disposable. Like you watch it, you listen to it, you enjoy it, whatever, but then you quickly forget about it. But I feel like a great song or a great book or a great flick or a great game or great whatever, they last, they matter, they give meaning to your lives. And I think this movie is gonna stick around. Like, is it gonna be the next Thelma and Louise? 
I don't know. I mean, Thelma and Louise was a monster hit at the time, but like Thelma and Louise, which had generous quantities of comedy kind of sprinkled throughout, this movie can be pretty funny. It's just, it's funny in a much more disturbing way without saying what the line is or what the circumstances are. There's an early scene that's a mix of like performance enhancing drugs and bodybuilding and sex kind of all rolled into one. And this is one line by Katie O'Brien where I almost had to excuse myself from the theater. I was laughing so hard, but it was, it was precisely what I needed to keep the movie from feeling like too dour and too grim. And much to my surprise and much to my delight because I'm a sick fuck, they save one of the grimmest moments or I guess one of the grimmest solutions to a problem right for the very end, which I was thrilled by because I hate it when a movie kind of chickens out like in the last 20, 30 minutes. And there are a lot of comedies and a lot of thrillers and a lot of horror movies that'll do that where they're exploring some pretty unsavory, evil, disturbing terrain, but then they'll chicken out and they'll basically restore the status quo and everything will end more or less happily at the very end. And that, that used, they used to happen in the 80s and 90s all the goddamn time where you have like an hour long comedy that was amazing and then a half hour sad and weepy like bullshit drama. And it just happened again and again and again. Or with horror films, suddenly everybody just, you know, Everybody lives and just goes home with a smile on their face and every, everything just goes back to normal. Nobody in this movie is going back, to nor going back to normal at the very end because they've all said and done things that you can't take back. Like once you've committed like the most violent murder imaginable, well then, yeah, you're, that, that, that is the life you have chosen. And it's clear from a lot of the revelations or a lot of the hints that are kind of teased along the way like a trail of breadcrumbs, perhaps these lives were chosen by them a long time ago. And we're just seeing one chapter and their ongoing saga, like, you know, lifestyles that include a lot of, a lot of crazy shit. So it's like, yeah, how, how, how much more can I say without starting to give things away? I'll just say when it comes to great acting, great writing, great visuals, great drama, great excitement, this movie delivers. I'm overselling it, but it's just a very solid, entertaining thriller. But because we so rarely get solid, entertaining thrillers, it's very easy to overreact and be like, holy crap, how come people don't do this all the time? We're in the 80s and 90s. They did do these kind of movies all the time. And a lot of people are going to say, oh, but it's, like, you know, but it's different because you have uh, two ladies at the core of the story. Well, I mean, Thelma and Louise and Bound were both movies from the 90s. So, admittedly, in Thelma and Louise, they were not romantically involved, but they were very intimately involved, like you know, very close friends. But I feel like... There are very few things that are new under the sun, but if things go away for a while and then they come back, they feel new all over again. So my hope is that A24 is going to make a pile of money on this. And even if the rest of the industry is unwilling or unable or just too afraid to make lurid sexual thrillers with, a, with generous quantities of violence, at least A24 is here to preserve movie culture for the rest of us who like seeing these kinds of stories on a regular basis. Give me one of these movies once a month. I will always show up with a big, big goofy grin on my face. In any case, I just want to say one final time. I loved Kristen Stewart in this. I really loved Katie O'Brien in this. And uh, I mean, Ed Harris, shit. He's a fucking living legend, but it was a thrill to see Ed Harris just go into the, the meanest, gnarliest, like Tony Soprano side of his personality. But like, it's like like the white trash version of Tony Soprano, but it just, if you have a taste for white trash at all, you're gonna fucking love Love Lies Bleeding. And it's interesting because I think Rose Glass is from in the UK. Hang on, let me see where she's from real quick. Rose Glass, from born in London, England in 1990, but she seems to have a real ear for or taste for these kinds of uh, these kinds of characters. So I applaud her for being willing to pursue this kind of pure genre storytelling because in America in the 1940s and the 1950s, you had so many authors. I mean, Raymond Chandler is kind of like the more respectable version of that, but you also had people like... Um, uh, who the fuck wrote? Uh, you got like Mickey Spillane and you got Jim Thompson. And um, who, who wrote Postman Older Things Twice? Anyway, look up the author of, um, I think, James N. Kane, I think that's his name. But there were so many pulp novelists who were writing these kinds of stories all the time. And I feel like there's like an ebb and flow to it. But whether you want to call it film noir or hard boiled or just like a, a, a crime thriller the, or romantic thriller, the term is almost kind of immaterial. We all know like the vibe and the energy of these kinds of stories. And I'll probably be going back for Second Helpings after I've had a chance to see Dune Part 2 a few more times. So right now we're very lucky. We've got a, a mean and nasty little indie flick to enjoy and we've got a big giant blockbuster to enjoy and that's the way it always should be. The, 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 the world of movie culture needs variety and whether you like blockbusters or independent films, it's always nice when you've got options at the multiplex. But I think that's all I've got to say for now. Hope you enjoyed this spoiler free review. If so, please consider liking the video, subscribing to the channel, hitting that notification bell. But let me know what you think down in the comments below. I look forward to hearing everybody's thoughts, but more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards.